we went through an example of sliding window flow control to illustrate some of the features of this protocol. That is, we are allowed to send more than one frame before we have to wait for an app, a window size of frames. And that's actually a parameter in the protocol. So uh, under different conditions, you'd set the maximum window to different values. Maybe the, uh, the technology or the link that uses the sliding window flow control would define the value of that parameter, maximum window size. What's a good value? It depends upon the relationship really between the propagation delay and the transmission delay. And these two examples which you have uh, printed out give one scenario where the propagation delay is 200 time units and the data transmission is 100 time units. And if you follow through and uh, see with a window size of 3 how much we're allowed to send. With those delays it turns out we can send 3 frames 0, 1 and 2 taking 300 time units and then with a window size of 3 we'll have to wait for the act to come back before we get the next one. So the timing in this example turns out such that we send three frames consuming 300 time units. The first act doesn't come back until 510 and therefore we need to wait for that act to come back because the window size is limited to, limits us to sending three <coughs> frames. And the result is we get this process of send three, wait for an act, send three, wait for an act and so on. So the efficiency is with delivering three frames per 510 time units and it, just in this particular question to make it more interesting I said that the data transmission 90% of the time we send payload the actual data, 10% of the time we send header. So we really spend Every 510 time units, we spend 270 time units transmitting payload. We spend 300 time units transmitting our frame, but only 90% of that is payload, so 90% of 300 is 270. So we send 270 time units sending payload every 510 time units. 270 divided by 510 is about 53 percent the efficiency of this protocol which is at the bottom of that picture. In this other case same scenario but we have a window size of 7 so we've changed the parameter of our protocol but the same link with 7 frames we're allowed to send 7 before we have to wait for the ACK The seventh frame would be frame with sequence number six. But it turns out with the particular propagation delay, we're still transmitting the fifth, or the, actually the sixth frame, frame with sequence number five, when we get the act back. So in this case, if we have an, a, the window of seven frames, we're still transmitting frames in that window while we get the first act back, receiving an act means we can transmit more. So in this case we never have to wait for an act to come back because the window is large enough that we uh, get the first act before we complete that window. That is we get an act saying you can send one more, we transmit one more and then we get another act saying we can send one more, we transmit one more and that continues forever if we keep going. The end result, A is always sending frames 100% of the time sending frames, B spends 100% of the time receiving frames, 90% of what it receives is payload, 10% is header. Hence we get an efficiency of 90%. That's the best case we can get given a, uh, the, the payload to header ratio. So here we calculate the efficiency, efficiency simply from the ratio between payload and header. 90% of the frame is payload. So this is the best we can achieve. If we increase the window up to 8, it doesn't get any better. 
We can't send more. If we decrease the window down to 6, I think if you check with 6, it still achieves the 90%. Because with a window size of 6, we'd get to transmit frames up until 5 before we have to wait, but we get the act back, so that's okay. If the window size was 5, I think if you do the calculations, it's slightly lower than 90%. We spend 500 time units transmitting, then wait 10 time units before the first act comes back. So there's some optimal window size in this case. <coughs> if we know the propagation delay, we know the transmission delay, we can find an optimal window size that gives us the best efficiency. Any questions on sliding window flow control? The general operation and the efficiency. There is a quiz available today, this afternoon, and the quiz has about five questions on stop and wait flow control, sliding window flow control, and the next things that we're going to talk about, the error control mechanisms. And, and you'll have to do some calculations like this. Given a scenario, given the propagation delay and the transmission delay, what's the efficiency we can achieve? So you'll get some practice with that. This question is the, the coloured picture that we have printed there, the green and red one. That is, uh, the data frame of 9,000 bits, 1,000 bits header, 90% payload, 10% header, and if you do the calculations, we get data tr transmission time of 100 milliseconds, propagation of 200 milliseconds, AC of 10 milliseconds, with either a 2-bit sequence number or 3-bit sequence number. So the answer to that is those two pictures. We've focused, maybe go back to this one, we've focused on data going in one direction only. So here, the rules for the protocol are for data going from A to B. A maintains its window, for the sender and B maintains the window for the receiver and they follow the rules to deliver the data. But of course in many applications we'd like to send data back in the opposite direction. Okay? That is B would like to send data to, to A. So the general approach is you treat the different directions independently. That is you use sliding window flow control to send from A to B and for data coming from B to A you use a different or a, a, an independent implementation of sliding window flow control to send it back. That is, you use a different set of variables for sending in the opposite direction. There's no relationship between the data going in both directions and the windows. But there's one exception. And the exception is commonly used in protocols. It's called piggybacking. We note here that B receives three data frames and sends back an ACK. An acknowledgement contains no data in this case. The receive ready message is just a short message saying, I'm ready to receive frame with sequence number three. Okay, so a short message, no data included. But if B also wants to send data back to A, then piggybacking is the approach is instead of sending two messages, the ACK, acknowledging the previous frames and a second message with data going from B to A, combine them into one message. Create one message which contains data and inside the header of that data you indicate also that this is an ACK and the next frame expected is 3. ACKs are usually, you think of an acknowledgement as just header. A data frame is header plus payload, we can combine the two. Create one frame with the payload and the header fields which serve the purpose of the header for the data plus the header for the ACK. So that uh, saves on transmitting uh, some, some bits across the link. 
So that concept of combining data in one direction with the ACK in that same direction is called piggybacking. We piggyback uh, the data on top of the ACK or the other way around, the ACK on top of the data. I think we'll not say any more about that. We may see some examples uh, in later systems, but I, uh, just be aware that we can improve the transmission in both directions by combining a data and ACK frame. I think towards the end of the course we may see examples of piggybacking. Everything up until now has been about flow control. We don't want the sender to send too fast to overflow the receiver. And when we've analyzed flow control, we assume that there are no errors on the link. Everything that was sent was received. So that was our assumption so far. Let's ex change that and let's consider what if we send something and what sent is not received. We have an error on the link, our frame is lost, or we send something and the frame received has bit errors inside and the receiver cannot correct them. So what happens when we have errors? Turns out we can use similar protocols to provide retransmissions of frames. If you remember back to before the midterm, we talked about error detection with parity bit. We can send a frame and the receiver can sometimes detect if there are errors inside that frame. And we also said we have forward error correction. We can send a frame specially encoded such that in some cases the receiver can correct the errors. But in some cases it couldn't correct the errors. There were certain cases where it's, it's not perfect. So we still need some way to ask the sender to retransmit, to send again. And that's what we'll see here. So we need a way to detect and correct errors. For example, we send a frame and because of errors it doesn't get to the destination. We say that's a lost frame. Why? Maybe there's a lot of errors on the link or maybe the, 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 there's actually a device in between the sender and receiver and that device fails for some period of time. So the frame doesn't get there. We may also send frames and they arrive at the destination but they have so many errors in there that we cannot use that data. So we'd call that a damaged frame. Lost and damaged frames. Lost, not received, damaged, received but with errors. How do we deal with them? Well, we have error detection and forward error correction, which we've discussed previously, but they're not perfect. So the other mechanisms we use, we use acknowledgements. We send a frame to the destination and the destination sends back an act saying, thank you, that frame is correct. No problems with that frame. That's a positive acknowledgement. I've received the frames with no errors. That's one approach we'll see. We may have a negative acknowledgement. Send a frame to the destination. The destination sends back a message, sorry, that frame you sent me has errors. Okay, that's an acknowledgement that something's gone wrong. And if we detect something's gone wrong, we need retransmissions. We send a frame we get some message back indicating that the frame wasn't delivered or it had errors, so we retransmit that same frame with the hope that the second time we send it there are no errors and it's received correctly. When we combine that with a positive acknowledgement, we'll need a timeout mechanism. The approach will be, I send a frame to the destination, I wait for a positive acknowledgement. If the destination receives that frame, it sends back a positive acknowledgement saying thank you, everything's okay, and then I move on. But what if I send the frame and there's an error and the destination doesn't receive the frame? If it doesn't receive the frame, it's not going to send a positive acknowledgement. And if I'm waiting for a positive acknowledgement, I'll wait forever. So we'll implement a timeout mechanism. I send my frame. I wait for some time 
If I don't receive the act within that time, then I'll assume it's lost and resend, retransmit. So we'll see that in play uh, in three different implementations of protocols. They're called Automatic Repeat Request, or ARQ for short. And the three ones we'll look at, the three general ones, are called Stop and Wait, ARQ, Go Back N, and Selective Reject, ARQ. And it turns out that the mechanisms are almost the same as, as Stop and Wait Flow Control and Sliding Window Flow Control. And we'll see they're very similar. That is, Stop and Wait, ARQ, is built upon the mechanisms of Stop and Wait Flow Control. And the last two, Go Back N and Selective Reject, use a sliding window type approach. So let's go through them. We'll spend a bit more time on stop and wait, and the last two we'll just summarize. The stop and wait ARQ protocol is based on the flow control equivalent. The source sends a single frame. Remember, stop and wait flow control, send one frame, wait for the date, uh, ACK, send the next frame, wait for the ACK, and so on. Here the source sends a single frame, but we now introduce a timer. So you can think, I send my frame, and then I start my stopwatch. And I start counting time, and I'm waiting for an ACK to come back. If an ACK is com comes back, then I stop my timer and I can move on to the next frame. That's the normal case. No errors. I send my data. It gets there to the destination. The destination sends an ACK back. I can move on to the next frame. What if no ACK comes back? For example, I send my frame. There's an error. B does not send back a positive acknowledgement. Well, the timer is used here. If my, we say the timer expires eventually, we have a timeout. So we'd have a parameter that says, Wait for an act to come back up to a maximum of X seconds. And if we reach that time, then, and we haven't got the act, then we'll retransmit. We'll send a copy of that frame that we just sent. What does the destination do? If the destination receives a data frame, it contains no errors it's error free, then the destination can send an ACK. If the destination receives a frame which contains errors, it's what we call damaged, then it discards that frame. It's as if it didn't receive it and no ACK will be sent. Our frames will include sequence numbers, we'll see why in a moment, but we need, at le we need a one-bit sequence number in our frames. With one-bit sequence numbers, the frames will go 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. So let's see it in, in operation. Just an example of the normal case. In this case, there are no errors, so it's easy. And it looks just like stop and wait flow control. For example, A has some data to send at this time. It transmits a data frame. Note that there's a sequence number in the header. The first one will label zero. Transmits the data frame. When B receives that data frame, it processes. Once it's finished processing, I say the data is delivered. And when the data is delivered, we've finished processing, we can send back an ACK saying, a positive acknowledgement saying thank you that data was successfully received and as we saw with sliding window we use the concept of an acknowledgement number saying thank you the next one I expect is one so the data had sequence number zero the ACK has an acknowledgement number of one because the next sequence number expected is one we don't say, thank you, I just received data zero. I say, thank you, I now expect data one. We send that act back. 
because it's stop and wait, A transmitted the first data frame, even if it has more data to send, it's not allowed to send until it gets the ACK back. It receives the ACK here, so it transmits the second data frame, data 2. The sequence number is 1. It arrives, maybe there's some processing, All right, so the processing is not instantaneous, it may take some time. Once we've finished processing, we send back an ACK with a 1-bit sequence number. I just received data with sequence number 1. What number comes after 1? What number comes after 1? Not 2. 0 comes after 1, when we only have 1 bit to count. 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. Okay? When we have a counter in a computer, we, we, don't, we can't go up to infinity, because when we store that value, we, don't, we have a certain number of bits. So here we just have 1 bit to store that value. We can only go up to 1 and we wrap back to zero. So, data with sequence number one was received. The next one I expect is zero. So I send back an ACK, acknowledgement number zero. We already had the third piece of data ready to send, so now we can transmit it, and then an ACK will come back. So you'll see data, ACK, data, ACK, data, ACK, and so on. And the sequence numbers are alternating, 0, 1, 0, 1. If you look at the data, 0, 1, 0, 1, and so on. So that's the simple case. There were no errors. I want you to try and draw a diagram of the same scenario where the first data frame is successfully delivered, but the second data frame has an error in it and doesn't get delivered to, to B. So try and draw that, I say this diagram, where this one's the same, that's easy. This data frame doesn't get to B. It's lost for some error in the link. It doesn't arrive. Then what happens? The timing doesn't matter so much. I mean, we're not giving the exact scale of the timing just to show that uh, the first one will be successful, the second one, something will go wrong. And then see what would happen according to the rules of stop and wait ARQ. Draw this, but where the second data frame is lost. So the first data frame will look exactly the same as the previous picture. That's the easy case. And I will, I will not draw the processing time. Let's assume that as soon as we get it, we send back an ACK. So this is our first data frame, so we'll say data 
sequence number 0. This will be ACK with ACK number 1. Thank you for data 0. I now expect 1 to come back. And to keep track that we remember this is the first piece of data. And at this point in time, the first piece of data is delivered to the destination user or application. So A has the first piece of data, number one, and it's delivered at this point in time. Then A has some more data to send, so let's send it. And the, the next piece of data, we include sequence number one in the header. Note that this is the second different piece of data, data two. And what happens? Let's assume that we transmit it. And there's an error. It doesn't get to B. In this case, the frame is lost, for example. What happens next? There's some problem on our, on our link. We transmitted the frame, but there's an error in the link, and it doesn't get to B. What does B do? What does B do? Nothing. B does nothing. Why? Because B has received nothing. Assuming B's got no data to send, B's just the receiver. It received an ACK. Okay, it received, uh, sorry, it received data and sent an ACK. And that's all B is going to do. Receive data, send an ACK. It sent the ACK, the previous one, and B is waiting for data, waiting, waiting, waiting. B is not going to do anything because it's not going to receive this data. We said it's lost. It doesn't get to B. B doesn't know it's lost. B is at the other end point. B doesn't know that A sent it because it wasn't sent, uh, uh, received. So B does nothing. What does A do? How does A know that this data is lost? I transmitted the frame think maybe a simple case the link actually has two segments from my laptop connects into say a switch a small intermediate device which then connects via another cable to the destination computer B my laptop's A the switch is just some intermediate device that allows me to go a bit further and then destination B let's say I sent a frame to the switch the switch failed for a short period of time there was an error and the frame disappeared it doesn't get sent to the B. So, how do I know that? How do I know my frame was lost? I don't receive an ACK. How long will I wait for an ACK? I could wait forever, <laughs> but then I would never get to send anything. So we need a timeout interval. So we need another parameter that says that Right, if we wait for too long, let's give up waiting and try again. So the way that would be implemented, we'd think that after transmitting the frame, we would have done it here as well. Maybe we even draw that. After transmitting the frame, say we start a timer. And in this case, we start the timer and if we receive an ACK back before the timer reaches its maximum value, we say a timeout occurs, then that's okay. We can move on. But in this case, we'll start the timer, and there'll be a maximum value, and let's say it's at this point. The timer expires, or sometimes we say a timeout occurs. Depends upon the value. Let's say the timeout period may be uh, 500 milliseconds. 
So I transmit my data, I wait, I'm waiting. If I wait for 500 milliseconds, then I say timeout occurs, a timer expires. We'll have an upper limit then. And that allows, well, that's when A assumes that something's gone wrong. I've waited enough time for this data to get to B and enough time for B to send an ACK back, but I haven't received an ACK. That suggests that there's an error. So when the timer expires, then we retransmit. The timer expires, so we realize uh, I'm most likely not going to get the ACK. Something's gone wrong, so let's try again. Let's send a data frame. And it's a retransmission of the previous one. This was the second piece of data. We actually send that second piece of data again. And the sequence number, it's the same as the previous one. It's still sequence number one. Let's say in this case it was successful. The data does arrive. There wasn't an error. Our, our device is working correctly again. The data arrives. B receives a data frame and receives the second piece of data and can send back an ACK. And the ACK says, thank you, I just received one, I now expect zero, the next number in the sequence. And of course, we would have started our timer in this case as well. We send the data, we start the timer, but it doesn't reach the maximum. We get the ACK first. There are two events that can happen at A after I send data. Receive the ACK or timer expires. Whichever happens first triggers what we do next. In this case, we receive the ACK before the timeout, before the timer expires. Receiving the ACK means we've been successful. We can move on to data three. The next data has sequence number zero, and it's the third piece of data. So the green numbers indicate that this is different data. And we can send the data, get an ACK, and continue. We'll not draw anymore. Any questions so far on the retransmission of stop and wait ARQ? We now need a timer, and if our timer reaches a maximum predefined value, retransmit. Okay. Not so hard, this one. Consider the second case. What happens? So consider the same scenario again, a third time but the acknowledgement is lost. The ACK for the... So consider the case where first one successful, data gets to B, B sends an ACK back, and the acknowledgement is lost. We just covered lost data. Now draw the scenario when there's a lost ACK. the second act that comes back is lost.
So just repeating, same as the first case, data one successful, or data with sequence number zero is successful. Data with sequence number one is transmitted, it gets to B, sends back an ACK, the ACK doesn't get back. See what happens. This is data zero. This is ACK saying thank you, I now expect sequence number one. And this was our first piece of data. And at this point in time, B has received data one. And we, I note here, the protocol that B receives data one has processed it and think it passes it on to the application at computer B or the user that's sitting at the computer, they use it. Now this, moving on to the second piece of data, transmit, it gets there okay this time. We send an ACK and that we have an error. So this is the second piece of data, data, Sequence number one. We would have had the timer here. Maybe we can draw that. It didn't expire. That is, the we started the timer, but we got the act back before it expired. So we can stop the timer and move on. Here we'll do the same. We'll start the timer. B receives data, processes and passes at that time that data onto the user. Then we send back an ACK. Sequence number zero. I just received one, the next in our sequence is zero, but we have an error. The ACK is lost. We may lose frames in either direction. What happens next? Complete the diagram, com continue and see what happens next. What's, what's A or B going to do in the next step? What's A going to do? Why will it send data again? And how does A know the ACK is lost? The timeout, okay. So the timer is going to expire because we're not going to get the ACK back. So draw Right, we'll never get the act back, it's not coming. So from A's perspective, I've sent data and the act's not coming back, so we know that eventually the timer will expire. After some time, we'll have a timeout. And then see what happens after that. We time out, that triggers a retransmission. We send again data. We use the same sequence number because it's the same data. It's the second piece of data. And let's assume it gets there this time, no problems. What happens next? 
What does B do when it gets the data? Again, decline or ignore? B. Correct. B gets the data and realizes, ah, this data is the same as one I received before. It's already received the second frame. How does it know it's already received it? How does, right, how does B know that this piece of data received is in, in fact the same as the previous one? It could look at the bits, okay? But how do we know that the bits, even if they're the same, whether it's two pieces of data which are the same or one piece of data which is repeated? We can't tell. The only way to know that this piece of data received now is the same as the previous one is because it has the same sequence number. B previously received data with sequence number 1. I'm expecting 0. If I receive data with sequence number 1, I ignore that data. I don't pass it to the application or user. I don't use that data again. So we'll say we ignore that. But we still send an ACK. The ACK says, I'm still expecting sequence number zero. The previous data re received was sequence number one, we received it. I'm expecting the next one I'm going to uh, process and, and use will be data with sequence number zero. When A receives this ACK, it knows that that data was successful and it can move on. You can move on to the third piece. So importantly here, with the lost ACK, B, the receiver of the data, ignores the retransmitted data because it's received a copy already. If we process that, receive, that second copy, that would be a problem. Imagine the data was a message going to the bank from some ATM to the main office saying, increase Steve's account by 10,000 baht. That was the data message. The bank gets it here and increases my account by 10,000 baht. But the ATM didn't get an act back, so it repeats that message and sends it again. If the bank office didn't ignore it, then it would have increased my account again to a total of 20,000 baht. So that's the problem of processing that second data. We should ignore it, but we still send an act back saying, I've got it already. Move on to the next one. And that allows A to move on to data frame 3. So two cases there, a lost, lost data in the first case and lost acknowledgement. Damaged frames are similar. Essentially a damaged frame, I receive it but it has errors, is equivalent to a lost frame. Just ignore the damage frame. Discard it. Yep. Is it possible to have a timer on the B side? Uh, a timer on B side. Where would you want a timer on B side? Like, for example, the way we had the diagram for the lost data. Mm -hmm. B, right. 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 Right here. So the suggestion is we receive data, and we, uh, if we have a timer here, we don't receive data. The next data in some time, then that indicates something's wrong. 
Now the problem with that approach is that sometimes A may not have data to send. Okay, so in our case A is always sending data to B, but sometimes A has data to send, then it stops for five minutes. So having a timer in that case will not work because B will not be able to distinguish did I not receive data because something went wrong or did I not receive data because A's got nothing to send me. So B can't keep track of that because it cannot distinguish that case. A is the only one that knows whether it's got something to send. So that's where we use the timer. Any other questions on stop and wait ARQ? Yeah? What does the dot mean? The dot means at that point in time. Just to highlight here, right? The dot's not significant, all right? But I mean at this point in time, we've received the data, I've looked at the data, processed it, and the contents is passed on to the user. Ignore the dot if you like. So now really we've extended the stop and wait flow control to also handle if we have errors. So we can use, use this protocol to do flow control and error control. It provides both features. And the reason we use a sequence number if you go back to stop and wait flow control, there was no sequence number. There wasn't one needed. Here we must have a sequence number for this case for B to distinguish that this data received is in fact the same as the previous one. If there was no sequence number, there would be no way for B to know is this a retransmission or is this just the same data sent uh, uh, two times. So we need a sequence number to distinguish between retransmissions. How long should the timeout be? 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 How long should the time out be? How long should the time out be? I'm asking you a question, sending you a message, I'm waiting for an answer. He's not ask, answering fast enough, so I resend. I waited a little bit. I waited for half a second, but he didn't answer, so I retransmitted. Didn't work so well. I kept retransmitting, not giving him enough time to answer. The time out, the time that you wait before you retransmit, should be long enough such that they've got time to respond. If it's too short, we'll keep retransmitting, which will be a waste. Maybe he knew the answer, he was about to tell me, but had no time to. In our protocol, really the timeout should be long enough such that the data gets to B, B has time to process that data, has time to transmit an ACK, and that ACK can propagate back. So the timeout should be maybe usually in practice slightly larger than the typical time it takes to get the data there and get an act back. If it's less, then we'll always retransmit. So it should be larger than the time to get an act back. Now in practice that's hard to know. How long does it take computer B to process a message? A doesn't know that. So usually we make the timeout slightly larger than what we'd predict it to be, or the typical case. But what if the timeout is very large? What if I ask you a question, you don't know the answer, and I wait for two days for your answer? Then that's very much a waste of my time, very inefficient. If the timeout interval is too large, and we lose data, coming back to the first one, If this timeout interval is very, very long, we transmit the data, it's lost, we're waiting for an act to come back. If we wait for a long time, then it's a long time spent not doing anything, and that's inefficient. 
So the timeout interval should be long enough to allow B to reply and not too long such that we wait a long time in the case of an error. So there's no best one answer but it should be at least longer than the time it takes to get a response and it's usually sl slightly larger depending upon the conditions in case for example the processing time increases but not too long and in fact in different protocols they may have ways to estimate and change the timeout interval in say an exam question or a quiz question I may say assume the timeout interval is 20 milliseconds then calculate what happens so that's stop and wait ARQ just jumping back it used positive acknowledgments and retransmissions after timeouts it was based upon the stop and wait flow control mechanism the next two approaches are based upon the sliding window flow control mechanism and you understand that that's more complex we will not go through them in too much detail but we'll just introduce the concepts first one is called go back N with sliding window flow control we're allowed to send multiple frames before we have to wait for an act so the source can send a, a window size of frames and with error control maybe one of those frames in the window is lost or it arrives in error so if there's no error it behaves the same as sliding window if there is an error detected by the destination then we'll have a negative act or sometimes called a rejection or reject message if data goes to B, B realizes there's an error then it can send back a special act saying this frame was received incorrectly or there's an error, this frame is missing please retransmit that frame so we use a negative act here how does the destination know there's an error? well if we send a window size of frames like frames 0, 1, 2 and 3 and the destination receives 0, 2 and 3 it realizes 1 is missing sequence number 1 is missing and that detects an error let's, let's look at the example and then we'll, we'll see the description of the different techniques the example is here, uh, it's quite small let's see if I have it here so here we have a window, I think the window size was a maximum window size of 7 and the, in this example B is going to send an ACK or receive ready message for every two data frames it receives in the normal case so what I'll do is at B I'll just keep track of the frames it successfully received and the frames sent by A so A sends frame 0 so we say 0 is sent and here 0 is received ok that's fine and let's say all right, frame 1 is also sent 0 and 1 and at this point in time B receives frame 1 so it's received 0 and 1 and it sends back an ACK so this is a normal case saying I'm ready to receive frame number 2 right, so this is sliding window flow control nothing's different at the moment frame 2 is sent 0, 1 and 2 are sent frame 2 is received 
and then frame three. We'll get to an error in a moment. This is what's sent and this is what's received. So this is the normal case and we send back an ACK. I'm ready to receive frame 4. And in fact when A receives this RR2, I'm ready to receive frame 2, it really acknowledges the first two frames. That is, A has sent 0, 1, 2 and 3 and it knows B has received 0, 1. Because the receive ready 2 means that it knows that B has dealt with everything before 2, 0 and 1. What happens next? Here we send 0, 1 and uh, we've sent 4. Zero and one are done, in fact. We've got an act for them. Four doesn't arrive at the destination B. There's an error here. So here's our first error occur. So at this point in time, we've actually sent an act for indicating everything up until four is done. So we should have drawn that here. Zero and one are done. That is, I've, I've acknowledged 0 and 1. I've acknowledged 0 and 1. And now I've acknowledged also 2 and 3. I received 2, I received 3, I'm now ready to receive 4. 2 and 3 are done as well. What happens next? Here, we receive this ACK and transmit frame 5. Which frames are done from A's perspective after receiving that act? Zero and one were done before. When we receive the receive ready four, it means two and three are also done. Everything up until but not including four, zero to three. I'll just underline them to indicate, right, we're finished with them. What happens next? In fact, we're going to transmit frame 6. We'll just keep track of that. Zero and one are done. Two and three are still done. Four, five and six are outstanding from A's perspective. They've been sent. We haven't yet got an act for four, five or six. What happens at B? We've received 0, 1, 2 and 3. We've acted them already. They're done. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Ah, I receive more data. I receive frame 5. This indicates to B there's an error. I've in the past received an act 0, 1, 2 and 3 and now I receive 5. What happened to 4? So B realises that 4 is missing because it should receive the data in order. And that indicates that there's an error and we send this special negative act or a reject message. 0, 1, 2 and 3 are still done. We receive 5. Because 5 is received out of order, we discard it. We throw it away. And we send back a special reject message saying, I'm still expecting frame number four to tell A maybe frame four has been lost. So importantly, we'll see compared to the next approach here, when we receive a frame out of order, we've got zero, one, two, and three, we haven't got four, then we receive five we discard those frames out of order. We throw away frame 5 and in the next step we'll throw away frame 6 as well. Why do we throw them away? Because it makes it simpler for the receiver. We don't need buffer space to store them. We don't need to keep track of them. And in, in, uh, in some communication devices we need to have a very low complexity and low memory requirement transmitter and receiver. So saving some buffer space, saving some memory, 
is a, a goal in some cases. So here we discard 5 and 6. We send back that reject message. So even at this point, what we've received is 0, 1, 2 and 3. And they've been successfully act. What happens when we receive the reject message? A has transmitted 0 through to 6. 4, 5 and 6 have not yet been act. But then it sends, receives a special message saying B is still expecting 4. And the reject indicates something bef has gone wrong. Now what A does in that case is assumes 4 is lost and goes back and retransmits everything that it is currently outstanding. The outstanding frames are 4, 5 and 6 so it goes back and retransmits those, four, those three frames, 4, 5 and 6. And the name go back n, go back and retransmit n frames where the n frames are those outstanding. So you see Ah, something's gone wrong. I need to retransmit four plus those which are, have been since have been transmitted since four. So I go back and resend four, resend five, and resend six. Uh, what will we do here? Well, we'll see what happens at B. We resend 4, a retransmission. We receive 4 OK this time. And in fact, we send an AC. 0, 1, and 2, and 3 are done. And sending AC saying, I'm ready for 5, so 4 is now done. Then we receive 5 and 6. And at the bottom, we're going to send receive ready 7, indicating all of those frames are done. Here, up until 4. So that's the main feature of go back n. When, you, when the receiver detects an error, because it receives frames out of order, it sends a reject message or a negative act saying something's gone wrong. Please retransmit everything since that frame. Any questions so far on go back in? Four, five, and six were retransmitted. Should five and six have been retransmitted? It seems a bit of a waste to send five and six because we've previously sent five and six and they actually got to be. But to keep things simple at B, B discarded them because they're out of order. So the next approach we'll see is, can be more efficient. We w won't retransmit 5 and 6, we just retransmit 4. But to do that, it's more complex at the receiver in that we need to have some buffer space to store 5 and 6. We'll see that's the alternative, selective reject. Here we keep it simple by just resend everything since 4. The rest of this picture covers another case of an error. Uh, I think we'll not, not spend much time on the rest part, but it covers the case when an ACK is lost, the receive ready. I will not keep drawing the numbers on there, uh, or maybe we can. Let's see what happens to complete this one. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 have been sent. Here we receive a receive ready for 5, so we say five and six have been sent, six was sent, receive ready five, so zero up to four are done at this point in time. We transmit seven.
with act up until f four. We're still waiting for an act for five. And in fact, although it's not shown in the other parts of the diagram, similar to stop and wait ARQ, we start a timer after transmitting data. So when we transmitted frame five, we started a timer because we will still expect to get an act back, back eventually. I've sent frame five. If I don't get an act for frame five, that indicates an error. And that's what this case is showing. I've sent five, six, seven, in fact also zero here. Only up until four have been act. And since sending frame five, my timer expires. A timeout occurs, we say. That is, I've waited long enough for a frame, uh, for an act for frame five. I've waited too long, so maybe something's gone wrong. Well, what did go wrong? This act was lost. So here's a special scenario. When the act is lost, we send a, a special message saying, please retransmit the act. Okay. So this RR message uh, with this p-bit, don't worry about the p-bit, it's a specific implementation. The meaning of this is saying, please send me an ACK. Probably one was lost before. Why do I send that? I've waited too long for an ACK for frame 5. I got an ACK saying 4 was done, but I haven't got any since then. Alright, so let's ask B to send me an ACK again. And there's a special type of message to do that. Essentially requesting an act. And where'd my picture go? Ah. Sorry, I don't have it on the screen. We send that request for an act and then we send an act acknowledging everything that's been received. Let's finish it on here. Zero, one, seven is received. We've act up until six. Zero is received, the next zero, the, the ninth frame. And what are, where am I going to fit it? Uh, what happens at the end? I have to go back to here. When B receives this request for an ACK, it sends an ACK. Look at the ACK number one. It's saying everything up until one is done. It's received five, six, seven, zero, I'm now expecting one. So this last act in the sequence says to A, everything up until one is done, so we can now move on and it will send frame one and frame two. You can finish off writing the numbers on your picture, I've run out of space. Doesn't but there was a special case with the lost ACK. Maybe the main thing to focus on then go back in is the lost data and how it realizes that and goes back and retransmits all frames since that lost one. So when, when they send this request for an ACK, B sends back an act saying, all right, I've done everything up until zero, so now I expect one, and that allows us to move on. So two mechanisms there. We lost a frame. B recognizes that loss because it receives a frame out of order. 
It received five before four. So it spent a, sent a special reject message. A second mechanism, if we don't get an ACK within a reasonable amount of time, we time out, then we can request an ACK. Please resend an ACK. And then we can move on based upon the ACK number. Any questions on go back N? Selective reject is almost the same, but we don't go back and retransmit those four, five, and six. We just go back and retransmit four. Same scenario. Zero, one, two, three. We can keep track. I'll just draw at the receiver B. We receive zero. We receive one. And we acknowledge both of them, saying I'm re ready for two. I receive two. I receive three. This is selective reject. And we acknowledge both of them. Zero, one, two, and three are done. Same as the previous example, I lose, or frame four is lost. We receive frame five. We've got one, two, and three. They are done. And five is received and buffered. Here's the difference between go back N. Go back N would discard five and send a reject message because it arrived out of order. Here, Again, we, in, we realize that there's an error. I've received 0 to 3, then I get 5. Where's 4 gone? So I'm going to send a special reject message, a selective reject. That is, it means you'll only need to retransmit a selected frame. I'm going to send that, but in addition, I'm going to use some buffer space at B to save frame 5 for future use. We're going to receive frame 6. We've got 5 and 6 in the buffer. And A, when it receives the selective reject message for 4, it tells A to retransmit only frame 4. It doesn't have to retransmit 5 and 6. And that's the main difference between selective reject and go back end. Go back in, retransmit multiple frames normally, selective reject, retransmit a selected frame. We send four, and now what have we got? We've got zero, one, two, three. We slot four into its place. We've still got five and six saved, and we can send an ACK saying everything up until six has been ACK now, ready to receive seven. So that's the key difference we want to illustrate there. Go back in is simpler. It doesn't require so much buffer space and processing at the receiver, but is, can be inefficient in that we retransmit frames which weren't even lost. Selective reject can be more efficient in that we only retransmit one frame here, not five and six as well but requires some buffer space and processing of the receiver. Which one's better? It would depend upon how many frames we often lose, uh, the, the delays in the links, and how complex we, we can accept and how much memory requirements we can ex ex accept on the receiver. Only the frames which are rejected or time out are retransmitted. Subsequent frames are buffered. 
It minimises retransmission. We don't retransmit as much as go back end. That's good. But it means we need a buffer at the receiver. That's bad. And it's more complex at the transmitter. It needs to keep track of what it's sent, which is also bad in some cases. Turns out that the simpler is more commonly used. So selective reject is maybe used only in, in some very special cases like satellite links when there's a long delay and it's a lot to retransmit. It's very costly to retransmit. And that completes our study of the three main ARQ protocols. Stop and wait, ARQ, send one data frame, get an act back, retransmit the data if we have a timeout. And then the two based upon sliding windows, selective reject and go back in, where we can detect an error based upon getting frames out of order. If I receive frames out of order, it indicates something's gone wrong. These mechanisms are used in many link level protocols and also applied for uh, many other protocols used on the internet today. So not just on links, but when I download a file from a web server to my laptop across the internet, it will be taking use of some of the mechanisms that we've talked about here. So that's why we spend some time on it. We talked about how long should a timeout interval be. There's a list of a few examples that use some of those mechanisms.